Thank you, Stephen. Uh, well, um, my name is Jonathan Katz, and as um, one of the trustees of the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies, I have the pleasure, indeed the honour, of introducing today's lecturer. So may I first say a warm welcome to this first of the OCBS and Dhamma Chai International Research Institute Michaelmas 2023 lectures. Uh, today's is the first in a series of three lectures, which has been made possible thanks to the generosity of the Dhammachai International Research Institute as part of the ongoing academic partnership between them and our Oxford Centre. We are very grateful to them for their support of these lectures, and not only for these, but also for our many teaching activities based at the centre. Um, for details of these, if you don't already uh, know them, then um, you can please visit uh, www.ocbs, Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies, ocbs.org. Now, um, <clears throat> the series this year will be given by Dr. Alexander Wynne, a name, uh, if it doesn't sound too tantric, uh, an expression to conjure with in Buddhist studies. Um, he may be best known to some of us as the author of the 2007 monograph, The Origin of Buddhist Meditation, or to others for his splendidly readable and authoritative uh, Buddhism and Introduction, published in 2015, if I remember, and uh, described by the founding father of our center and my esteemed teacher and friend Richard Gombrich as a remarkable achievement rich in insights. In addition to these, I could refer to a great wealth of other contributions in books, articles, and reviews, which are as sharp and instructive and eloquent as they come. And among these, of particular relevance to the present series, I must single out Alex's recent article in the Oxford Centre's own journal, the November 22, uh, 2022 number, pages 83 to 120, to be precise, uh, an article called Suicide, an Exploration of Early Buddhist Values. And of course, we at the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies are deeply grateful to Alex for his years as expert and conscientious editor of the journal and his continuing support in so many ways of both the Oxford Centre and of Buddhist studies more widely and internationally. So the series is entitled Suicide, Meditation and Anti-Realism, Three Problems in the Study of Early Buddhism. The first lecture today is entitled Suicide and will be followed in the next two weeks by Meditation and Anti-Realism. After today's lecture, there will be time for um, Alex to invite questions and he will uh, field and manage those questions, um, no doubt very expertly uh, himself. And so I now hand over to Dr. Wynne. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the introduction, though, and welcome to everybody wherever you are in the world. Um, just let me share my screen with you and bring up the um, the visual for you. Okay, I am now sharing. You should see the the title of this series of lectures, and I will shortly minimize. So, so it's just myself visible on the, the Zoom viewer. So the subject today, the, the subject that I am trying to get at is um, presented here in this title as almost three separate problems, three completely different things. Uh, what I really want to get at is not the um, explicit subjects as such, but try to draw some connections between them. So we have a lecture on, on suicide, which is, I suppose, an ethical problem, one on meditation, which is a, a, about spiritual practice, and anti-realism, we're dealing with metaphysics or ontology. And I'll be looking at uh, these subjects from a small selection of suttas from the Pali Canon, occasionally drawing on the Chinese Buddhist Tripitaka where needed. So out of these three 
individual problems, I suppose meditation and anti-realism are the most closely connected. Um, meditation is about Buddhists changing their perception of things, changing their consciousness, and then perceiving things in a different way. So the way that a Buddha or an awakened person sees the world will be the subject of the third lesson, the third lecture, and meditation, how, how altered states of consciousness are cultivated, the subject of the second lecture, very closely related. Out of these, suicide does not seem to be connected at all. But I'm not really going to focus on the problem of suicide as an ethical issue. But really, I want to get at what the texts say about nirvana, spiritual liberation. So from this perspective, you could say that all three subjects are very closely connected indeed. I'll be looking at the problem of nirvana, the problem of altered states of consciousness, and the problem of understanding reality as it really is, according to how Buddhist texts describe it from the awakened perspective. So that is the explicit content of these lectures. Now, at a deeper level, what I'm trying to do is getting at some of the ideological and doctrinal processes which were involved in the formation of Buddhism in its early days. I want to try and form an idea of the big picture, how Buddhism began what happened in the beginning, how it happened, and why it happened. I've chosen these three particular subjects because I think they shed further light on this. So the problem that I'm really trying to get at, the underlying problem, is really quite a, a challenge of uh, the imagination. The creation of Buddhism is some monumental achievement in human history. Buddhism was an entirely new phenomena in the cultural history of India, and in the way it framed religion. Buddhism is a unique, profound, and wise tradition. It changed the world. So it's an immense challenge to us to try and think ourselves back into the past, try and understand what really happened. When we do look at um, modern academic work on early Buddhism, the study of Buddhist origins, what we tend to find are two schools of thought. The first is that we accept the early texts as presented in extant Buddhist canons. So this is the traditional story of the Buddha, the Buddha's enlightenment, followed by his mission and his teachings. So the Buddha delivers the first sermon in Sarnath, consisting of the middle way, the four noble truths, the noble eightfold path, etc. Shortly after this, immediately after this, the first five disciples ordain. They then attain enlightenment themselves, and the Buddhist mission begins properly. This is the traditional story. And one way of dealing with this in academia is sort of euhemeristic, which is to say, take away the supernatural elements, take away anything which is magical and mythical, and what remains is plausible. What remains is a plausible story about the origins of Buddhism. In academia also, there are those who are, I suppose, skeptical of this humoristic approach to Buddhist origins. And I think this would probably define the mainstream of, of thinking about early Buddhism is skepticism. Skepticism of the traditional account stripped of its supernatural elements. So according to the skeptics, and they have, of course, very good reason for this, the account of the, um, the traditional account is a foundational myth. It is a story which sort of encapsulates what happened in a sort of mythic form. We don't really know how to verify it. And we don't really know where to draw the line between reality and myth. So when we try to take a euhemeristic approach, well, what do we include as myth? What do we include as a supernatural element? Is the Buddha's enlightenment to be regarded as such? So it's very difficult to rationalize the story of Buddhist origins and present it as a historical fact. Another problem with the euhemeristic approach is that it sort of assumes that Buddhism is historically inevitable, 
it's a little bit ahistorical, which is, of course, impossible. Buddhism doesn't sort of form, you know, fall out of the sky fully formed. It must have been a human creation over many generations. So in, in terms of these two approaches to understanding why and how Buddhism happened, there's not been really any progress beyond that. We either accept something like the traditional story or we were skeptical of it and say, maybe there is some truth, but we can't really know. So what I would like to do here is move away from this traditional, the acceptance or rejection of the traditional story and take a different approach by plunging into the Buddhist, early Buddhist canons. What I'm trying to do is sort out from the mass of old textual material elements which, from which we can reconstruct a, an actual history of early Buddhism. So, for example, within the Pali canon, we have a huge mass of very old material. We have lots of data and details about people, times, and places. I think a lot of this detail has been missed and overlooked. The early Buddhist canons also include texts where Buddhists are presented debating with each other. And I find these the most, some of the most interesting early Buddhist texts. When you have a debate, this is when things get more realistic. Now, you can pre present a debate in mythical form. You can write a, you, you have a real debate that happened in history, and you can give that a sort of mythic veneer that is certainly possible. And we will see an example of it in this lecture today. But when we look at early Buddhist texts, and when we look at the debates meant to have happened, it gets a little bit more realistic. And I think it's easier to draw out historical realities from that. So we have to work our way through the maze of text, and we need to find a path that leads through it. And what I will try to do, my, my approach to trying to do this, will focus on three things in particular. So the three things I will be focusing on are implicit meaning, outliers, and a combination of these two the implicit meaning of outliers. Now, the, the point about implicit meaning was made very long ago in the history of Buddhist studies in the West. Uh, one of the founding fathers of Buddhist studies, T.W. Rhys Davids, talked about implicit meaning when he translated the, uh, his translation of the Diga Nikaya. Now, the point is that Buddhist texts are not presented, early Buddhist texts are not really presented in the abstract. It's not usual that the Buddha just says, here are the Four Noble Truths. Here are the noble, is the Noble Eightfold Path. Here is the meditative states you have to attain. What we very often find is that you have a dialogue between the Buddha and some interlocutor. Now, the Rhys David's point was that not everything about this dialogue will be stated in the actual form of the text. The participants in the dialogue, the Buddha and the person he is speaking with, they have certain cultural and intellectual presuppositions, and these are very often not stated. So we have to try and draw out the implicit meaning. We have to go beyond the surface meaning of the text. We have to try and fill it out. So that's what I will be trying to do here, is look at this, look at Buddhist texts from the perspective of getting their implicit meaning. And I will, will be particularly focusing on what I, well, what could be called outliers, by which I mean marginal content that really differs from what we expect of an early Buddhist text. So within the, the mass of early Buddhist literature, we have all of the standard doctrines. And then sort of around the edges, we have things where we don't really know what is going on. We have things, things happening, ideas, practices, events happening that don't really make sense according to our understanding of early Buddhism. So we have to try and work this out. How do we read these things? How does it fit in to our knowledge of early Buddhism? What does it tell us about how early Buddhism was formed? <clears throat> 
it's very easy to ignore this material because it is marginal after all. But a very good explanation of early Buddhism would explain it. A, th a good theory would include all of the marginal things and show how they fit into the whole. Now, especially difficult is where you have this marginal material, which we don't understand. And to try and make sense of it, we try to get into the implicit meaning of it. Now, that sounds maybe more complicated than what I will try to do, but if you have a marginal text, which things are happening you don't understand, we have to scratch beneath the surface and see what is implied by the text. So that's what I'll be starting to do today by looking at a couple of texts in the Pali Canon, which describe the suicide of two disciples of the Buddha. I want to try and redraw the map of early Buddhism or start to do so today. And I suppose the closest thing that exists to what will follow in these three lectures would be Richard Gombrich's book, How Buddhism Began. I think that book was published now in, in about 1996. And most of the gist of that book, I think, is that the creation of Buddhist doctrine emerges from a dynamic encounter with early Brahmanism, particularly as expressed in the Upanishads. Now, this process, according to Gombrich, also involved a considerable amount of debate. So that's what I'm going to try and focus on. What will be coming out of these lectures is that there is a dynamic encounter with a sort of Brahminic or Upanishadic tradition. I will go a little bit beyond how Buddhism began and Gombrich's thesis, because for me, that tradition of Brahminism is could be called a, a, maybe an unorthodox or heterodox meditative tradition, which probably existed in the, the late 5th and 4th century BC. So I'll be focusing on the, what I think is the, uh, the Buddhist encounter with this tradition, and in particular, the debates that it caused within the early Buddhist Sangha. Now, I think that the, the first text I will look now, which records the suicide of uh, a, a disciple of the Buddha, it's, this is our first outlier. And this, when we get into the implicit meaning of this text, we can see that there must be some um, very complicated and interesting encounter happening with a Brahminic meditative tradition. So the text I'm talk about, talking about is in the first volume of the Sangyutta Nikaya, uh, the Godika Sutta. So this records the, the, the suicide of the Bhikkhu Godika. And I've just given a reference here to the article which Jonathan mentioned in the introduction, where I, I discuss in much more detail what is happening in this text. So the basics of this text are fairly simple. The Buddha is staying in Rajagaha in the bamboo grove. Venerable Godaka is living nearby on Mount Isigili. The text tells us that Godaka has touched a temporary liberation of mind before he falls away from it. This happens six times. And then when Godaka has attained the state for the seventh time, he decides to inflict the knife upon himself, which is a way of saying he will commit suicide. So while Godaka is in, he's actually having this thought according to the text, um, while he, after he has attained this meditative state for the seventh time, he wants to, to commit suicide in this account. Now, this is actually very strange. Why, why would an early Buddhist bhikkhu wish to do this? In early standard early Buddhist doctrine, of course, meditative states, their, their attainments are impermanent. Nobody gets into a meditative state and stays there permanently. Of course, you come out of that state, you return to the world. So why do we have a text where a bhikkhu is, somehow finds this situation unsatisfactory? 
So anyway, the text continues. Godica inflicts the knife before he falls away for, from the state for the seventh time. After this has happened, the Buddha takes a group of disciples up to Mount Isigili, and there they find Godika lying in his cot, his shoulders twisted around. According to the Pali commentary on the text, Godika committed suicide by lying on his back and cutting his jugular vein. Jumping forward to the text conclusion, the Buddha says to his group of bhikkhus, do you see bhikkhus that dark cloud moving about here and there? And they, they see it and say yes. And the Buddha says that this is Mara, the, the demon Mara is looking, searching for Godika's consciousness. But the Buddha concludes by saying, with his consciousness unestablished, Godika, son of good family, has attained final nirvana. So according to this conclusion, the Buddha has stated that the act of suicide in this meditative state has finalized Godika's liberation from the round of rebirth. So the Buddha is, is almost sanctioning the, the suicide of Godika by saying that this act completed Godika's spiritual path. The meditative state that Godika had attained was somehow necessary for his final liberation. His meditative state must have been a sort of temporary anticipation in life of the liberation after death, which, which was to be expected. This is all quite strange. Godika is not acting in a normal Buddhist way. So in, as I've said, in normal Buddhist thought, you have meditative practice, you have attained high states of meditation, altered states of consciousness, but you do not call those states temporary liberations. And then the Buddha does not say if you die in that state that you have attained liberation. So I think the key doctrinal point here, dying in a meditative state is liberating according to this sutta. And that was Godika's aim. He wants to commit suicide in this state, so he attains liberation. He is out of sangsara. Where do these beliefs come from? Now, I don't think there is any explanation within Buddhist canonical literature or the exegetical material that comes afterwards. But I think that a comparative study of early Brahminic texts sheds some light on this. I think that Godika's belief about meditation, about anticipating liberation in meditative states, and then when you die, only really attaining liberation, I think that these beliefs are expressed in the early Upanishads and the texts which continue the Upanishadic teachings, the Moksha Dharma, which is found in the 12th book of the Mahabharata. So just to give a few examples of a lot of evidence from uh, the Moksha Dharma of the Mahabharata on what, what is called in, in Bra early Brahminical yoga. So from chapter 231 of the Moksha Dharma, we have the statement, the one who sees the unmanifest, the immortal residing in mortals whose bodies are manifest. When he dies, he is fit for the state of Brahman. A very standard state, a very, <clears throat> very standard teaching in the Moksha Dharma. Seeing the unmanifest is uh, a way of talking about having a meditative realization of something which is beyond the world, some immortal liberated state beyond the world. But it is only when you are when you die that you attain this state for real. So again, from chapter 289 of the, of the Moksha Dharma, thus the knower of truth through yoga, disciplined in self-conscious concentration, attains the place which is hard to attain when he has abandoned the body, O king. So again, the yogin, 
somebody who is an adept of inner meditation. He attains the liberated state only after abandoning the body. And from the same from the same teaching, just a few few lines further on, verse forty one. With a spotless understanding, having quickly burnt away his good and bad karma, having practiced the highest yoga, he is released if he so wishes. The general teaching which emerges from the earlier Upanishads with regard to meditation, and which is expressed in great detail in the Moksha Dharma, is that the point of spiritual practice the point of inner meditation, concentration within, is to attain a vision into the immortal state of Brahman, the source of the cosmos, the divine source. This experience is only a temporary anticipation in life of what will happen afterwards. This experience burns away your good and bad karma, so that when you finally do die, you are not reborn. You merge into the, the state of Brahman. Now, I think in particular, just the statement at the end of verse 41 here, just at the bottom of the, the screen, you will see, he is released if he so wishes. There is no explicit statement in the Upanishads or the Moksha Dharma that you should die in a state of liberated meditation in order to finalize your liberation. But what there is, is, is things like this. Once you have attained the, the vision of the immortal, you can be released whenever you want. You can be released if you so wish. And I think this is exactly what Godeka is thinking. He has attained some sort of temporary uh, spiritual anticipation of release. He so wishes to die within that state now. And that's why he commits suicide. So just to sum up some of those things I've just gone through. Early Brahminic texts on yoga assume that medita meditative realization guarantees liberation at death. If one is a realized adept in the Brahminic tradition, why should you carry on within sankara? Why not rapidly advance towards final liberation? Now, let us imagine that Godika is this type of realized adept. He has experienced what liberation is like, and he prefers that state than coming out of it and back into the normal world of experience. He doesn't want to go on in sankara. He's realized the way out. Therefore, he commits suicide in this state to finalize his liberation. And this is what the Buddha, in fact, confirms. Now, I think by any definition of an outlier, this is certainly it. Amongst the mass of early Buddhist teachings, this is an outlier. This is not a text with ideas that can be explained by standard Buddhist teachings on meditation, the path, and, and nirvana. We have to somehow get in between the lines and draw out the implicit meaning. I've tried to do that with this analysis by looking beyond the Buddhist canon, looking into the wider religious world of ancient India to try and help us get at that implicit meaning. Now, if this analysis is correct, what it means is that we have alongside the early Buddhist tradition, we have a non-Buddhist meditative tradition influencing the early Buddhist Sangha. Now, it's not just a, a meditative tradition giving some sort of, exerting some sort of influence. It's an extremely pessimistic tradition, saying that when you attain liberation, there's no point carrying on as a human being. Now, what is the, the doctrine which comes out of early Buddhism, of the, the Buddhist canon, is that nirvana in life is valued as much as final nirvana at death. And this is certainly not what is, we're getting in the Godika Sutta. So the Godika Sutta is this strange outlier. 
it seems to be expressing non-Buddhist ideas, and I think we can reconstruct them. So, but that is not, not the only thing strange about this text. We have a very strange mythic interaction between the Buddha and the demon Mara. Now, in traditional biographies of the Buddha, of course, Mara is the, the, the demon who tries to tempt the Buddha away, tries to prevent the Buddha's enlightenment. And then, of course, when the Buddha is enlightened, Mara comes along and says, well, you've attained nirvana, you don't need to continue. So just to... Now, what we're going to get, I'm going to show now in the Godika Sutta, is a very strange interaction between the Buddha and, and Mara. So just to contextualize that, let's look at a standard source on, on, these, on the, Buddha, the Buddha's interaction with Mara from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. So in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha is nearly at death. Mara comes along and reminds the Buddha what had happened immediately after the awakening in Bodhgaya. At that time, Mara had said to the Buddha, as he is still seated under the, the tree of awakening, Mara comes along and says, Mesa, the blessed one, the Sukkata, now enter final nirvana. Now is the time, sir, for the blessed one's final nirvana. So, I mean, this is sort of logical. Mara's thinking you have attained nirvana. Why do you wish to carry on in the realm of suffering? But of course, the Buddha denies Mara. The Buddha says that he will carry on. He does this because he has yet to build up the Buddhist community. I don't think that is the only reason. I think um, the way the early, early Buddhist teachings approach this is that, as I mentioned earlier, nirvana in life is valued as much as nirvana at death. So this is the traditional perspective on the Buddha and nirvana. Mara, sorry, the Buddha and Mara. Mara is trying to tempt the Buddha to escape from the world finally. And the Buddha is preventing Mara and saying he will carry on as a human being. What we find in the Godika Sutta is the exact opposite of this. So Mara appears in this text when Godika is having his contemplation about possibly committing suicide. When that happens, Godika, Godika's mind is read by Mara, and Mara immediately visits the Buddha. Mara tells the Buddha that one of his disciples is intent on death. He should be stopped. So this is what Mara says to the Buddha. How can a bhikkhu in training, unrealized but delighting in the sasana, die? In fact, before anything can happen, before any intervention can be made, Godaka commits suicide. But then the, the Buddha realizes this and says this to Mara. The wise act thus, they do not long for life. Godika has uprooted thirst along with its roots and attained final nirvana. Mara is very depressed about this and the text concludes with the statement, overcome with sorrow, his lute fell from his armpit and then that pathetic spirit disappeared right there. So in this interaction, the roles of Mara and the Buddha are flipped. Mara is trying to prevent a bhikkhu from, from dying. Instead of tempting the bhikkhu to die, Mara is trying to say that this shouldn't happen. And on the other hand, the Buddha is defending the bhikkhu's suicide. So I think in this encounter, which flips the traditional roles of the Buddha and Mara, Mara must represent the early Buddhist mainstream. The early Buddhist mainstream would say, of course, Godaka has not attained liberation. Attaining a, a meditative state, which is temporary, is not the same thing as attaining nirvana. And if we look at the language of, of Mara, 
Mara describes the bhikkhu Godika as unrealized but delighting in the sasana. It is a basic Buddhist point perspective, a basic Buddhist value that following the path should be something joyful. Suicide really doesn't have any, any place on it. So the Buddha plays the opposite role. The Buddha really takes on Mara's role. So how can we interpret this strange interaction? Well, I think we have to see the Godika Sutta as the product of some unorthodox wing of the early Buddhist Sangha. This wing of the Sangha has been influenced by a non-Buddhist tradition of meditation. And it's in this tradition to defend its ideas that has flipped the role of the Buddha and Mara. So in supporting Godika's suicide, the composers of this text are rejecting the early Buddhist mainstream. It's a pretty complicated interaction if we try to work out the implicit meaning, but I think this is unprecedented in the Pali Canon and early Buddhist literature, as far as I'm aware, to have the Buddha and Mara portrayed completely against type. So I think this. This outlier, when we study it comparatively, and when we look at the, the tensions within it, it reveals an early Buddhist Sangha, which is a little bit different from the standard story of Buddhism. So we have a Sangha being influenced by an important non-Buddhist tradition. We have obviously tensions and disagreements about the ideas coming from this non-Buddhist tradition. And I think inevitably that must have, you know, that must have meant that debates about the practice of meditation broke out. Now, also, I think it's worth reflecting on just the the myth of the Buddha. It's Buddhist myth, of course, encapsulates tries to encapsulate fundamental meanings of Buddhism and human life in poetic form. One doesn't have to speculate academically about what the Buddha myth means. You know, we have the, the Buddha is this sheltered prince. He doesn't realize the suffering of the world. Eventually he does and be, he becomes disillusioned. So this is a poetic way of, you know, explaining the human condition. We try as far as possible to avoid fundamental facts of life. And Buddhism is here, is presented in the myth as an antidote to that. We don't really need to have an academic explanation of that. But what about this strange episode in the myth where the Buddha's attained enlightenment and Mara comes along and says, why don't you enter final nirvana? What is the point of teaching anybody? How do we explain that? That is not really speaking about anything particular or general in the human condition. So I think what this myth is, uh, what this study of the Godika Sutta shows is that Buddhist myth is actually encoding historical processes. If we can understand the language of myth, we can decipher it. And this reveals certain processes happening in the formation of Buddhism. The myth really hides a historical situation, which the Buddhist Sangha is in close contact with this unorthodox or this different meditative tradition. That is what the myth of the Buddha encountering Mara is about. This tradition is more pessimistic than the early Buddhists. It's saying it's okay to die as soon as you attain nirvana, liberation. Once you are liberated, the point of liberation is to escape Sangsara. So why not do that immediately? So I think all of these, um, this sort of process of discussion and dialogue with non-Buddhists is sort of the implicit meaning of uh, this aspect of the Buddhist myth, the myth of the Buddha, especially when we get to see how this myth is portrayed in the Godika Sutta. Now, the Godika Sutta is 
one of three texts which records the suicides of bhikkhus, disciples of the Buddha. The two other bhikkhus who are, commit suicide are Chana and Vakali. Now, I just want to look now at this, a different account, the, suicide, the account of the suicide of the bhikkhu Vakali, just to see um, how the Buddhist tradition is dealing with something that doesn't involve the suicide of a meditator. So the Vakali Sutta, again in, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, again located in and around Rajagaha. The Bhikkhu Vakali is staying in a potter shed. The Buddha is staying nearby on Vulture's Peak. The Buddha finds out that Vakali is ill and goes to visit him. Vakali tells him what, what his state is and that he is not getting better. It's clear that he will die. So the Buddha asks Vakali whether he has any remorse or regret. And in response, um, Vakali expresses what are rather trifling concerns about not being able to visit the Buddha. Now, in other early Buddhist texts, Vakali is portrayed as a disciple um, who, whose psychology is very much dominated by faith. So Vakali is a faith person. He is not a liberated arahant. It makes perfectly good sense within the, um, the narratives of early Buddhism that Vakali would express regret at not coming to see the Buddha. But in response to Vakali's statement, the Buddha comes out with this very famous, very famous statement indeed of the Buddha. Enough Vakali, what's the point of you seeing this putrid body? He who sees Dhamma sees me, and he who sees Dhamma, who, he who sees me sees Dhamma. For Vakali, seeing Dhamma one sees me, and seeing me one sees Dhamma. So the Buddha is responding to Vakali, saying your, your regret is, is, uh, is trifling. Do not be too concerned about it. Following this, the Buddha gives Vakali the not-self teaching, describing the impermanence and not-self uh, of the five aggregates. After that, the, after giving that teacher, Vakali, um, sorry, the Buddha leaves, and then Vakali has his helpers take him outside. His reasoning being, how can somebody like him consider making his time inside a building? So the scene is set for Vakali's suicide. Before the suicide takes place, in the night before it takes place, the text goes on to say that two deities visit the Buddha with messages. The first deity says that Vakali is intent on release. And the second says that being well released, he will be released. In the morning, the Buddha sends off some bhikkhus to go and see Vakali and say what has happened and to report what the deities have said and adding the Buddha's own message, which is, do not fear Vakali, do not fear, your death will not be bad. So clearly the Buddha has taken the, the messages of the deities purely in the sense that Vakali is about to commit suicide. So to the messengers that the Buddha sent, Vakali tells them to inform the Buddha that he has understood the not-self teaching. He has no doubt that he has no passion for the five aggregates. So where does that leave us with Vakali's spiritual status? The bhikkhus who had been sent by the Buddha leave. And immediately after they go, Vakali inflicts the knife. And we have a, a similar sort of uh, scenario as the Godika Sutta. The Buddha then turns up with a group of disciples. He asks if they can see a cloud of dark smoke, and they can. And he explains that this is Mara searching for Vakali's consciousness. <laughs> 
But as Vakali's consciousness is unestablished, he has attained final nirvana, just like in the Godika Sutta. Now, this conclusion is a bit strange. Um, it's not up until this point that we really understand that Vakali is, is an arahant. At the beginning of the sutta, the Buddha asked Vakali, do you have any regrets? And he expresses a regret. Now, that is not the behavior of a liberated arahant. And the Buddha would not ask that question to somebody who is an arahant. Remember that Vakali is portrayed in other early canonical Buddhist texts as a disciple of faith. When the Buddha gives the not-self instruction, this looks like a guided meditation to a person in need. After the two deities have then visited the Buddha and given their messages, the Buddha still assumes that Vakali is not an arahant. So the Buddha sends a message to Vakali to reassure him. The Buddha's message is that Vakali's death will not be bad. Now, again, this is not the type of discourse that goes on with regard to a Buddhist arahant. Vakali is not enlightened. According to the what I think is the, the general narrative of the text, there is nothing really, the narrative, the way the Buddha behaves, does not indicate that he is regarding Vakli as a liberated saint. But the deity's messages have been taken by others who have studied this sutta um, as an indication that liberation has happened. So if we re remember that the first deity says to the Buddha in the night, the bhikkhu Vakli is intent on release. Of course, the word release is a word which very often indicates, denotes liberation in early Buddhism. But it doesn't always uh, have this meaning. The, the root, the verb much, does not imply, does not need to imply spiritual liberation. An example would be the Marganja Sutta, where the, the verb parimuch indicates an ill per, uh, a, person suffering from leprosy's recovery, being released from leprosy. So the, the message of the first deity, which the Buddha doesn't understand as indicating liberation, we can just in, take this as an indication that Vakali will soon be released from his pain. And indeed, the Buddha responds by saying, Vakali's death will not be bad. Now, what about the second deity? The second deity is a bit more, the, the meaning is a little bit more complicated. The second deity states, being well released, he will be released. So we have two terms here. The second term, he will be released, vimuchisati. I think this is uh, just a paraphrase of the first deity statement that Vakali is intent on release. The real issue in interpretation here is the past participle, suvimuto. Now this very easily could be taken to indicate that Vakali has attained liberation. It could be taken to mean he is released already. So the question we have to ask, given the, the form of the narrative where the Buddha assumes that Vakli has not attained liberation, can we understand vimutto, subvimutto, in the sense of something other than final liberation? And I think we can. So in the Sangyutta Nikaya, uh, chapter 46, we have a definition of sense restraint as follows. The bhikkhu's body is still, his mind is still, well composed internally and well released. So we have exactly the same term here, so vimutang, 
is just equivalent to being concentrated. And then in the teaching to Sariputta in the Attika Vagga in the Sangyut, uh, sorry, in the Sutta Nipata, we have a verb near the end, uh, a verse near the end. Warding off desire for these things, the bhikkhu, being mindful and well released in mind, investigating the Dhamma thoroughly at the right time and being one pointed, he would dispel the darkness. Now, certainly the compound here, Sukvimutta Chitto, qualifies a bhikkhu who is not yet liberated. It means that this bhikkhu is in a state of meditation that anticipates insight, which affects liberation in the end. So I think um, in the context of the sutta, we really want, the sutta is not giving an indication that the Buddha understands Vakali as liberated. And if we want to try and understand it in that sense, it is very easy to do so. So in the main body of the, the Vakali Sutta, Vakali is not liberated. He's not liberated when the Buddha first visits him. He's not liberated when the Buddha leaves. The deities then in, intervene and give their messages. But all the Buddha seems to understand is that Vakali will soon die. He doesn't take the, the messages as an indication that Vakali has attained liberation. He sends a message that Vakali's death will not be bad. But then we have the Sutta's conclusion, and Vakali is liberated. So when the Buddha arrives and Vakali's corpse is found, we have the same episode involving Mara searching for the consciousness of Vakali. So the explicit message of the Sutta is the conclusion that Vakali is liberated. And I think previous studies of the Sutta have focused on this and taken it as their starting point that somehow this is about Vakali's liberation. And so they have read into what has happened, the fact that the strange fact that before this, Vakali is not treated as a liberated saint. So just looking finally then at the Godika and Vakali suttas in comparison. I mentioned earlier that the Godika sutta was composed by an unorthodox wing of the Sangha. So a wing of the Sangha influenced by a non-Buddhist meditative tradition. In that sutta, Mara the demon plays a key role. Mara is part of that sutta's narrative. So the episode at the end where Mara searches for Godika's consciousness, that fits the Godika Sutta fine. Its entire point is that Godika is liberated, Mara cannot understand it, and Godika's practices led to his liberation. He attained, he attained liberation at death through suicide. Now, in contrast to the Godika Sutta, the Vakali Sutta is not an unorthodox composition. Vakali is not an arahant. The Sutta doesn't describe his enlightenment. The text is about how a disciple of the Buddha prepared for death and was supported by the Buddha. So when the Vakali Sutta repeats verbatim the conclusion of the Godika Sutta, I think that is probably a later addition to the text. I think the Vakali Sutta is orthodoxy's attempt at responding to the unorthodoxy of the Godika Sutta. So the Godika Sutta is giving these very strange ideas and concluding with um, support for them, support for this extreme form of pessimism, saying that here is, this is liberation. Now, how would orthodoxy, emerging orthodoxy, respond to this? I think they have to say that Vakali, who received the not-self teaching, also was liberated. In the commentary on this text, of course, they give a, a detailed in, uh, description of how 
When Vakali is just at the point of cutting his throat, he realizes what's going on, he loses passion for the five aggregates, and he attains liberating insight. But that is certainly a later way of understanding the text. So I just want to conclude now with um, a few points about what the implications of this type of study are. Now, both the Vakali Sutta and the Godika Sutta are what I would classify as outliers. They stand apart from the, the vast majority of suttas in the, in the Pali Canon. Now, obviously, what is going on behind these, these texts, sorry, I'm trying to change the, the view to get myself on the speaker, but it isn't working. I will revert to gallery. I don't know what everyone else is seeing. But anyway, let me just wrap it up as follows. I think these behind these outliers, we must have a very complex historical reality. Things, events are happening and being commemorated in textual form. Somehow, there probably is the phenomenon of bhikkhu suicide in the early Sangha. And there is strange ideas about meditation. What is happening is getting sort of commemorated in a textual form, which we can't quite understand. And trying to draw out the meaning is, uh, I, I think reveals a different story of early Buddhism. So I, this lecture then, I've been not talking about suicide as an ethical problem. I'm looking at the prob nirvana, the doctrine of nirvana as um, the real problem which is going on here. The implicit meaning of these outliers is a story of tension and debate between emerging Buddhist orthodoxy and a wing of the Sangha close to a non-Buddhist tradition of meditation. Looking at the, the suttas in this way, this comparative uh, way of looking at the Godika Sutta sort of helps us get below the surface and see what the dynamics were in the formation of early Buddhism. With regard to the Buddhist, the myth of the Buddha, the traditional narrative of Buddhist origins, whatever the Buddha did, I think in the century after the Buddha, the Buddha's death around 400 BC, Buddhism, what Buddhism will become is up for grabs. There are a lot of tensions, a lot of debates, and the process to get to what we have as Buddhism is extremely complicated. What we have now is a story which sort of papers over the cracks and tells in poetic form sort of what happened, sort of it, it locates the poetic spiritual significance of the Buddha's mission. But after the, the legacy of the Buddha, as it was received, lots more happened in the fourth century BC. So finally, just also um, understanding Buddhist myth. I've talked about it being a poetic or spiritual way of looking at the fact of the Buddha's life and his teachings. But it's also... Um, can, it's also written in a language which I think we can decipher. And when we do that, we get at underlying historical processes. So the temptation by Mara, this important episode in the myth of the Buddha, Gotama, you've attained Nirvana. Why not give up the ghost? You don't have anything more to do. How do we explain that? Well, I think actually how we explain it is that we have a debate in, in and around the early Buddhist Sangha about the ultimate value, Nirvana. Now, what happens is the story we get told is this doctrine of Nirvana that has two types, Nirvana with a remainder of material attachment when you're still alive, and Nirvana when there is no remainder after you die. That doctrine was the outcome of these debates between in and around the Sangha between followers, disciples of the Buddha, later generations uh, coming after the Buddha, and the religious, the wider religious world around them, 
which I think key for the understanding of early Buddhism is a meditative tradition, which is unorthodox by Brahminic values, heterodox even, which exists in and around the kingdom of Kosala. And that is the closest thing that we have that, that existed to Buddhism. And Buddhism is sort of being formed in dialogue with it. So at that point, I will, I will finish this lecture and it leaves us perfectly placed for the second lecture where I will look at meditation from this perspective, from the perspective of not early Buddhist texts being completely consistent, but from the perspective of the early Buddhist tradition in dialogue and debate with ideas outside what they have received from the Buddha. So that is what will come next week. Um, for today then, I think we are...